So let's say you have created something and, and it, it has been validated, but then what happens from that point in time onwards? You have the original and you have the whole brain emulation. Mm -hmm. How do you treat each of these? Do you have to destroy the original? <laughs> do, you, do you give the, quote, replica or the copy the same rights that you would give the original? Is there some kind of a, I don't know, hierarchy between a second generation copy and a third generation copy of the copy? Mm -hmm. Well, from our perspective, I think uh, a lot of the things you can already sense just by saying them that they don't make a lot of sense when you, when you say them, right? Like this whole hierarchy of you know, who's more valuable, where, what do you base that on? Um, let's start with, is it really you? Which is really a question that comes up a lot. And the interesting thing is it depends on at least your philosophy. So first of all, it depends on what you think is you. Um, this is not very easily solved. Uh, you can look at a lot of the work by David Chalmers on that. Um, that it's not entirely clear whether you need to worry about continuity. So does there have to be a continuity between your biological self and the replica that's operating? Or is it completely okay to just put a huge separation in there? You, you build this entirely separately somewhere on the side and then activate it and then it's you. Um, that's not entirely clear and I was a fence sitter on this for a long time and, and I've, I've gotten a little better because uh, I spoke with Max Moore who gave me this, uh, he did a thesis so basically on personal identity and so he looked at all of these aspects and one of the interesting things that he came up with is that it's, it's really not so much about the process that you use or the procedure, it's more about how abrupt, how much are the differences because you yourself are now not the same person that you were when you were five years old. The reason why it is still you is because it's been a gradual change. It's not suddenly going from five-year-old you to tomorrow, it's you who you are now. Those would be completely different people. So it's about this gradual nature. If you made a whole brain emulation and it woke up in a black box and it had no sensation and everything was suddenly different, this could be way too dis dis uh, disruptive. That, that You might not want to consider that you. If basically nothing seems different and you're waking up and you look around and, hey, oh, okay, so that worked then there's not too much change all at once. So this is more the direction I'm taking right now in my view of personal identity and continuity of self. Though I still do worry about whether the process matters. Because you can imagine doing something like whole brain emulation in many different ways. So you could build the replica entirely separately, or you could do an in-place replacement of one neuron at a time. And those are different because in the case of the replacement in, in in place, there's never a moment where you get turned off and on or where it's very clear that you're just suddenly making this new physical entity. So they're different in procedure. Um, then you asked, is it okay to turn off the biological version? Well, again, I guess the procedure matters there a little bit because you might not even have that option. But, um, but I don't see any reason why you would. It's kind of like, okay, so even if they both are you to begin with and then start experiencing different things, which is fine, it's just you going in different ways you could go, right? Like we all have different paths in life that we could take. Um, why would one be less valuable than the other and be, it'd be okay to turn them off? I don't get that. It's like, you know, it's like two people are twins. Why would you kill a twin? That doesn't make any sense. But, but the issue is, is uh, for example, um, if I have a mind upload, and the original is still in existence, yeah. which one of them is my wife's husband, legally and practically? <laughs> yeah. And, and, and the if the original disappears, yeah. and there's uh, two or three or four uploads of me, identical copies of the copy, which one is the one? <laughs> yeah. How do yeah. we differentiate between them? If I have kids, which one would be their mm -hmm. father? Yeah. If I legally... Uh, place my upload to be my heir, which one would be the heir? Um, mm -hmm. All those sort of a, maybe paradoxical and crazy, but in, 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 a, in, a, in a deep sense, ethical issues, I, I think oh, yeah. are very important. So that's, that's actually the angle that I'm coming at it from, because, you know, I, I'm not a scientist. I don't 
really uh, care too much about the technical end of things. For me, the more important questions are why rather than how, why, and then so what? Mm -hmm. So what is like the biggest question? Okay, well, we me. can get to the so what afterwards, but we should deal with some of the ethical things that you brought up first and some of the legal questions that you brought up first. So, for example, um, Charlie Stross, I remember in one, of, in one of my favorite books, Accelerando, raised the question, if a mind-uploaded Muslim eats a virtual bacon, is he breaking the Quran uh, or not? I would say yes. <laughs> But but I that's mean, not really bacon because it's not coming from pig. You see, it's virtual. It's all in the definition of really. It's like so many things in in any uh, scripture. You need to decide how you're going to interpret it, and then you can base your answer on that. That's part of the problem, right? Um, and then, if you things, delete the copy, is that a murder? Uh, again, it's it's a matter of how you look at these things, and and yeah, we have to deal with that as a society. The thing that I find so interesting about so many questions rela related to new technology, including this kind of technology, is that very often it gets approached as if it's some really new thing that we've never faced before. We've never faced these kinds of questions before, when in reality it's just another variant of questions that we've dealt with all the time. So, you know, for example, um, the matter of uh, death and is it okay to kill someone? In the past, that really used to depend on who they were and what their position in life was. Like, if you were a nobleman and a peasant offended you, maybe it was okay to kill them. And if you had a slave, that was an entirely different matter too. Sure, it was, you know, destruction of property, but it's not the same thing. Now, we've evolved from there by changing our ethics and saying, okay, that's not right. We should really treat them all as equal. Everyone has these inalienable rights, etc. And perhaps we can evolve further to look at this also when we talk about people made up of different substrates. You know, is it the fact that this person is running on some other hardware very much different than them having a different color of skin? Well, you know, you should really think about that. But I don't think that these problems are unique. I don't think that they're that new in law. And all the other stuff about who is the, the, uh, uh, your, your wife's husband. Again, this is one of those things where, you know, we can look at some similar precedents when it's about things like polygamy versus monogamy and harems and all these other situations that have existed and just choices that you make about how you lead your own life. Um, but then, for instance, what about her choice? What if, for instance, exactly. for her, it's not so much about, is this the person that I like to talk to, but I like him to have that body there. Or, or maybe she doesn't like your body. Maybe she prefers, you know, <laughs> one of the others. I don't know. The point being, <laughs> the point being that it it also involves her choice, her wants and needs, and and so it's a more complicated question on one hand, but on the other hand, it's also a more familiar question because it's really about our decisions, what we think as people and as a society are the correct results. Laws, sure, they should get updated and rewritten and changed as necessary to deal with what we think is right given the new circumstances that we're in. And that happens for everything, for genetically modified fu foods to, to uploading. So I don't really see that that's any different. So, so let me ask you this then, uh, just continuing along that path of, of, of scientific development. Let's say we succeed um, in creating a whole brain emulation. Do you think that it wouldn't be very far afterwards that we could be able to do the reverse process, which is to say to take that emulation and install it, for lack of a better word, on a clean body, for example, <laughs> as the yeah, carrier? I, I don't spend as much time working on that part of it just because the data acquisition part is already so hard. Mm -hmm. But I do see that it's very important and I think that it's definitely the first thing that that people will want to perfect as soon as you have some way of doing um, an upload to a substrate independent mind. Sometimes the body you want to enter will be different than what we have now because maybe you are trying to travel to Alpha Centauri and you'd rather be a spaceship than be a human. But um, Or you just want to make your wife happy. <laughs> if that's the kind of thing she likes. Yeah, okay. Um, but uh, <laughs> But, but certainly, and 
this is actually one of these big questions people always come to me with but isn't it going to be a problem that a substrate independent mind doesn't have a body and then I kind of wonder why they made that assumption in the first place is does this have something to do with popular culture or movies or something that's been said about uploading before which is one of the reasons I don't really like the term it's very confusing there's nothing in there that says anything about not having a body I think that embodiment is essential because we're not just what's in here so much about the world is being computed for us by the universe around us like even just think about some primitive animal tracking prey most of the time it's sure it's going to try to predict a little bit ahead but it won't can compute the perfect path making a model of what that prey that it's chasing is like and how it's going to try to evade it and things instead it, it looks and gets feedback about where the prey is now and adjusts itself to that this is all computation being carried out in that environment by other things not by yourself so the in input and output is really important yeah my presumption would be that if we are so sophisticated as to be able to do to do and successfully complete the whole brain emulation, then the reverse process should be much faster and much easily accomplished than the original process. That's my assumption as well. Which and is it why wouldn't I'm be too far that's away fine. from that point. Yeah. yeah. So, so you agree with that? That's that's interesting. Yes, I do. Yeah. And, and let me ask you this then: Do you read any science fiction uh, writers that could potentially inform? Uh, your work in one way or another, is that a possibility at all? And if you do, who are your favorites? If I inform my work, as in the things that I could learn from or that other people could read to get an idea of what's... In, what in the important. sense that it could either inspire you or it could uh, bring to light some of the implications of your work that you haven't considered before mm -hmm. or it could help you come up with new and creative approaches of accomplishing your goals. Yeah. Well, as you already heard, it all started with, uh, with a science fiction story. Although, you know, I'd been thinking about things before then, but that science fiction story really crystallized where to go. And um, since then, yeah, I've read quite a bit of science fiction, but in the last, say, five, six, seven years, I've had very little time to do any recreational reading, so there hasn't been as much. But I must say that I have taken out a little bit of time to read some Greg Egan, because I really, really like his work. Mm -hmm. And, um, yeah, so I would suggest that, yeah, you can learn a bit about at least what sort of issues you need to deal with and what's going on in emulation when you read something like Permutation City. So that's the kind of place where you could go and look and, and get some inspiration. I personally have uh, come across Cory Doctorow and Charlie Strauss and Robert J. Sawyer and a number of other science fiction writers who have spent a lot of time thinking of the process and the implication of mind uploading. Mm -hmm. So I, I thought it, it would be interesting to see if you, if you yeah. sort of... And they raise lots of the ethic, ethical and, and sort of uh, primal questions that uh, could potentially arise in that situation.